Lecture 17. Lecture 16 is by far the largest, so and try and get through a lot of it today. Okay. Uh, what I have left under general sensory is pain, which we call nociception for noxious, uncomfortable. Uh, I'm going to have a guest lecture the week after the final. My wife come in and talk about pain in more detail. It's a very important subject if you go into any clinical um, area, and uh, she's been doing this for me for the last couple of years, and the students always appreciate it, so uh, that will be the week after the final, probably, uh, or the week after the coming test. Okay, so I cut down what I tell about pain to just a couple <laughs> little stories. Uh, it's an unpleasant, obviously, sensory type uh, sensation or activity. Uh, in some people, it doesn't even have to be real tissue damage. Uh, some people can be in tremendous pain from emotional, obviously emotional disruptions or emotional consequences. So it could be either a real or potential damage to a person. And it's very subjective. They classically, when you report to a physician, to a physician with complaints of pain, they ask you, uh, to rate the pain from 1 to 10, with 10 being the most intense. And so, because we have no way to measure it, and one person's 10 is another person's 2, unfortunately, so it's a very difficult thing for a physician to care for. Um, it's extremely important because it's our body's uh, ammunition to let us know we're in severe survival mode, something very serious is happening to us and we should take care of it. So it's definitely an extremely important sensation as far as our survival. The receptors for pain are free nerve endings, we call them nociceptors. Uh, free nerve endings you would think would not be very specific like the simian corpuscles or kidneys endings or anything, but they're very specialized chemosensitive free nerve endings that uh, there's a table that shows how they're connected to our nervous system, but uh, there's two primary connective systems. One is through uh, unmyelinated C fibers that are very um, small fibers and conduct very slowly. They're the low, lowest, uh, smallest diameter fire, fibers, and they are very slow conducting, and they conduct dull pain where the alpha A delta fibers are much larger in diameter and faster conducting and they're responsible for communicating to the central nervous system sharp or very intense pain. Uh, we have this whole nociceptive phenomenon is called polymodal, which means that the receptors uh, are sensitive to several different modalities. Uh, among them are thermal. We talked about both very cold and, and very hot temperatures last time as activating ten, uh, pain receptors. So definitely extreme temperatures cause a sensation of pain. Uh, mechanical means severe uh, pressure uh, uh, it from multiple sources. And chemical stimuli, and we'll talk about that because ultimately most of the uh, most of the uh, response is due to tissue destruction from temperature, mechanical or chemical stimuli, and that activates the receptors. Uh, it's a very slowly adapting response 
means that unlike um, smell and many other responses, uh, we lose the sensation even though the stimulus is maintained. In this case, as I said, for, with the example of a headache, they stay on with us forever and ever. They're very slowly adapting sensations. Uh, the stimuli is most often chemical in nature, even if it's initiated by burns or by mechanical means, because the cells are destroyed and, and often that intracellular material uh, contains chemicals that activate these free nerve endings. And one of the most important is potassium. A little bit of potassium in a wound will cause severe pain. And as you remember, potassium is extremely highly concentrated inside cells. So potassium is a very potent mediator, as is hydrogen ions. Strong acids really activate these nerve endings. And then there's some chemical mediators, uh, bradykinin, serotonin, and histamine, which all are potent inducers of, or activators of these free nerve endings. The pain fiber itself has collaterals that play a big role in this uh, activity. The pain fiber, when it sends its signal up to the uh, central nervous system, at the same time activates collaterals of themselves to release neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters are most often this substance P, P standing for pain, and result in a couple of phenomena. One thing substance P does is vasodilate small arterials in the area, which brings more blood to the area and therefore the opportunity to provide uh, uh, either uh, mediators of, of immune responses or mediators to stop coagulation or whatever, or start coagulation or whatever we need. And at the same time, uh, substance P stimulates mast cells in the area to release histamine. And histamine is a very potent uh, initiator of, of even more pain. So it causes what we call hyperalgesia. So there's initial uh, pain that's resulting with the, the inflamed tissue, but, uh, and that is in that immediate area of tissue damage. But then given uh, the release of histamine via substance P and so forth, there will be a secondary hyperalgesia, which means uh, uh, less, uh, a lower threshold for pain. And so those, all the nerves in those, that area will be super sensitive. And you're kind of familiar with that. If you uh, injure an arm, either broken a bone or even a very strong mechanical injury, uh, a short time later that whole limb will be very sensitive and you touch any place on the arm and you'll get a very responsive, uh, you know, sense of pain. So that the that delayed response of secondary hyperalgesia is predominantly due to release of substance P that uh, spreads out to the surrounding area and makes you um, careful in, in handling the tissue surrounding the damaged tissue. Uh, there's a lot of alterations or modulations of pain from other uh, inputs, and one of them is called the gait theory. And that is that even within the spinal cord, the signal coming out from pain receptors to the sensory cortex is altered. And uh, the A beta uh, fibers are thought to be responsible for this modification. And touch of those receptors can inhibit or reduce what we perceive as pain. And the, and the idea is something like this. If you have a painful stimulus going into the spinal cord to the first or secondary neuron that's going to send this up to the brain. This also has input from A beta fibers and even touch or uh, uh, some massage of the area around the injured site will cause inhibition of the signal as it goes forward. So this is the reason why it's not just useless that we rubbed our our ankle when we stub our toe or rub our arm when we mechanically injure our arm because even that r rubbing will reduce the intensity of the pain. So it's like we can send an interneuronal inhibi inhibition of the uh, 
secondary tract to the brain. Uh, massage at TENS, that's that uh, uh, nerve stimulation that we can use TENS stimulators to stimulate nerves in the area will uh, reduce pain and uh, transdermal uh, nerve stimulation. And acupuncture is thought to work also to, through this trap to uh, cause a reduction of the pain perceived by the central nervous system. So innocuous, innocuous input prevents some of the pain which we feel. And finally, uh, visceral pain, pain from the viscera in the abdomen, is often not um, located very precisely, and we call it referred pain. So often when a patient complains of pain, the classic is on the right shoulder raising down the arm, it may not be anything to do with shoulder joints or problems in the arm, but may be referred to uh, myocardial infarction, some sort of ischemia of the heart. Uh, well, very well, and often uh, understood problem. Lung and diaphragm pain often is felt in the upper back. So these are so classic that physicians, when you report pain in a given area, will think that it's probably originating from somewhere else. Pancreatic pain in the center of the chest, which is an unexpected. Kidney pain often the whole uh, trunk area. So these are well uh, uh, common uh, sighted pain from the viscera and we can often uh, understand very readily where it originates from because so often it's utilized or described by patients. The reason is that the pain from the intestines or other viscera shares same track with surface uh, pain receptors. So the pain receptors that come from the surface end up going up to the uh, brain, to the sensory cortex in the same track that the viscera uh, track does. So we can't discriminate in our brain from whether it's visceral or surface pain. So anyway, that's a little bit about uh, referred pain. And finally, uh, just a couple comments about drugs which we take to overcome uh, pain mechanisms, NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin or ibuprofen inhibit prostaglandin synthesis which is usually elevated in pain victims and so it inhibits this inducer or prolonger of pain and, and helps uh, overcome usually minor pain problems. Uh, we have bradykinin receptors, morphine. Uh, I mentioned before endorphin as being one of the uh, important neurotransmitters that works through these same receptors that morphine does. Uh, we have a whole endogenous system to reduce pain and it uh, works through endorphin receptors and morphine takes advantage of that. And finally, there are a group of uh, local pain inhibitors that we use for dental surgery and other such uh, local uh, surgeries and they prevent action potentials by blocking cation uh, translocation or, or channels and so uh, these particular nerves can't be polarized period, uh, for, in, for a period until this uh, agent diffuses or is metabolized from the area. So they block nerve uh, action potentials. Uh, proprioceptors we're going to uh, mostly focus on later and I just mention them at this time. We're talking about the different families and how they work in the fourth unit but these again are uh, receptors in muscles and, and tendons and joints that give us knowledge about the position these structures are in and also we use to control movement and we're going to save that story to motor regulation in the fourth unit. Uh, most of the afferents coming into the spinal cord come through what we call segments, and which have come to be called dermatomes. And the uh, chiropractors have made a tremendous lot of money over this idea. But all the the nerves from a given through, through like thoracic uh, nerve. Uh, spinal nerve four 
uh, takes all the inputs from pain and surface and temperature through that uh, spinal into that spinal tract. So the, we can pretty well know what type of information comes or where it comes from in each uh, segment. You notice the position of the man is drawn so that they're all vertical, and hence the idea is that we evolved this from uh, four-legged creatures, but uh, these all come up in vertical tracks up into the segment of the spinal cord. Uh, and this can be utilized for spinal anesthesia. We know which particular uh, nerves will be blocking from knowledge of this information. Also, when patients suffer suctioning of the spinal cord, uh, we can pretty well tell what type of losses these patients will undergo. The information, and we'll get into this in far more detail later when we get to the brain, but the information from all of these general senses goes to uh, a what we call a somato uh, sensory cortex, which is located on the cerebrum on each side. Usually these are received contralateral from the injured or affected side, and the, the somatotropic uh, cortex, we call it, is located just posterior to the central sulcus. And we're going to talk about different parts of the brain and different uh, marks, and one of the significant places is the central sulcus, which is right here, and just posterior to this, uh, there is a region that receives all the information from the surface as touch and pressure and all those uh, cutaneous receptors we talked about. The information is stored or received in that area in what we call a somatotropic organization, which means it's uh, kind of like, we used to call it a homonucleus, but it's like a man laying along the brain. And so there, there's di distinct locations of that cortex that receive each uh, different uh, information. And you notice the distortion in the, the sensitivity is proportional to how much area of that cortex is allotted to that structure. So the face is probably 20% of the whole surface, even though it's far less than of the surface of our body, and the hands another 20 to 25%. But the trunk of our body is a fairly small portion, 5 or 10% of the whole cortex. So again, some of the areas of sensation uh, because of a lot of, of uh, uh, conservation, uh, our need very little uh, cortex, or some of them, like the hands and the lips and so forth, require a lot of the cerebral cortex. Uh, so anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Okay, and it turns out the motor cortex is a lot the same. So I'm going to now spend, oops, that's not what I want to do. Uh, spend most of the time on the 16th lecture, which talks about what we call special senses. And, and so we're going to deal with, as I said before, when I brought up the sensory system into somatic and special, the special senses are those in the cranium that require complex uh, receptive devices, and probably the eyes, the best example, and that's where we start. Uh, both the the uh, anatomy text and the physiology text have lots of good uh, details about the structures and the physiology of the system, so I've got both of them listed, uh, and uh, uh, especially Warren and Mopic has very good uh, up-to-date knowledge of the transduction mechanisms and so forth for these senses. So we'll start out talking about the, the eye. Uh, like many structures, it's divided into three layers, and they call them tunics in this case, and so the fibr fibrous tunic is the outermost layer of the eye, and it consists of an anterior part, which we call a cornea, and a posterior part, which we call the sclera, uh, so that makes up this whole sphere that we call the eyeball, and the most anterior part of the cornea the most anterior part of the fibrous tunic is this very transparent cornea, and on top of that is a little epithelium that they've tried to indicate here called the conjunctiva, which covers the surface of the cornea. 
Uh, the cornea itself is transparent. There's no blood vessels, although there's ample pain and temperature receptors. Uh, the sclera is not as clear, it's opaque, which means light can conduct, but not very well. And it's all the fibrous tunic is made up of collagen and elastic fibers, and it's quite dense. You probably dissected an eyeball of a cow somewhere along your line, but it takes a good scalpel to cut through it. It's a very dense, thick structure. The next, and then the optic nerve exits the back of this. Uh, fibrous tunic, uh, and so right at the point it leaves the eye, I can call it a blind spot because there's no photoreceptors at that location. Then just inside the uh, vascular tunic, or the, the fibrous tunic is a vascular middle tunic, and it's shown very thinly between the retina and the sclera out here. It's a little light tan area represented here. But in truth, it's a very black, black structure. It's called a choroid coat. It only covers the posterior five, six of the eye or so. And it is dense in blood vessels and melanocytes. If you remember, you dissect the eye, it's, it's almost pink white. It's very, very black. And black uh, pigment absorbs light. So it doesn't reflect light back. So light passage comes through the cornea and lens and hits the retina, but once it gets through the retina, it doesn't reflect back through the retina again. It would be very confused. So the value of this melanocyte density is to absorb light so it doesn't go back through the retina twice. Some animals do have a reflective uh, vascular tunic which allows them to amplify light, but we don't, we absorb it. Uh, the ciliary body is the anterior part of this uh, vascular tunic. It's this thicker part on each side of the lens, and it forms a ring that surrounds the lens, and it's made up of two components, a muscle, ciliary muscle, and then some ligaments that hold or suspend the lens in position. And finally, just in front of the lens is a thin diaphragm, just like the diaphragm of a camel, camera that controls how much light comes into the eye, which you call the iris. And it, of course, is what gives the eye color, uh, blue, green, or brown, which is a hereditary uh, phenomena. But the color of the, but the, the diaphragm itself controls the pupil size in the center, which determines how much light goes into the eyeball. So looking at the eye from the anterior most aspect to summarize, on the surface of the cornea is a conjunctiva, then the next thin layer, the uh, next layer is uh, transparent, called the cornea, and then the iris shown right here, the colored portion, the center of the iris is the pupil. Uh, the ciliary body is shown here is made up of muscles that surround ligaments that suspend the lens. So anyway, it's a nice anterior figure that shows the structure. As I said, the, the term accommodation refers to both regulation of light and not of light, so it means the eye is really focusing the light. So the pupil accommodates by controlling, like a diaphragm, how much, what amount of light enters the, the the eyeball, and it does so by the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic reflex from the postganglionic sympathetics innervate uh, ciliary muscles that are radial in that iris. So it turns out there's both circular on the inside and radial, meaning they point outward on the outside muscles in that iris, and the radial ones cause the um, the pupil to get larger. So in dim light, the sympathetic reflex is to increase the uh, diameter of the pupil and therefore allow more light to get in. When you're in bright light, we want the opposite phenomena. We want the pupil to be small, very, very small. And that's a parasympathetic postganglionic effect. And it constricts the circular part of the iris or the inner muscles of the iris, and they get uh, tight and hence uh, end up with a very small area that light can get through. So that's a little bit about the first two layers. The innermost layer is by far the most complicated, the retina, and it consists of multiple layers of neurons as 
we'll see uh, the deepest layer of the photoreceptors that convert light into a signal or transduce light into a receptor potential. And they're really deep in the retina. Uh, and there's a couple other marks or uh, important spots of that retina. One I already referred to is optic disc or blind spot where, where no photoreceptors reside, where the optic nerve leaves. And the macula is represented right here. It's a site where the, you gain the most acute vision, which means that less convergence of the receptors, and we'll show you more detail of that in a minute. And the site, the ideal site of image focusing is center of the macula, point called the fovea. Uh, the lens is the responsibility to focus the light on the fovea. And if you were to look at it, often in that lab on the cow eye, they have you cut, essentially cut through a lens, and you'll see it looks like an onion with layers and layers of protein. Uh, crystalline proteins that look a lot like an onion. And it's very transparent, but it's again attached to those suspensory ligaments that can regulate its uh, thickness. Uh, a couple other uh, terms about the, the uh, structure of the eye, and then we'll talk about physiology more. We refer to the eyeball interior as an anterior and posterior cavity. So this large area behind the lens is called the posterior cavity and the area in front of the lens is called the anterior cavity. But what's confusing is we subdivide the anterior cavity into an anterior and posterior chamber. So often students uh, confuse those terms. So the anterior cavity is divided into two subcategories, categories, I guess you could say, or chambers. The anterior chamber is from the lens back to the iris, and this little place behind the iris and in front of the lens we call the posterior chamber. All of that cavity, anterior cavity, is filled with a salt solution, which we call aqueous humor or aqueous fluid. It's essentially a, very close to the con constituency of interstitial fluid. Behind the lens is the posterior cavity, and it's filled with a very viscous material that's called the vitreous humor, and it's a very thick protein uh, solution that uh, if you've ever dissected the eye, it looks like jelly, almost like a jello type material. The, the uh, direction the eye's focus is controlled by a set of eye muscles or extrinsic muscles of the eye, and there's uh, three pairs of these muscles that can direct the eye in any direction, the, the, uh, uh, they're all connected to, from the outer tunic to the orbit via tendons, and each facilitates movement in one direction. So there's a lateral and the medial rectus that's shown behind the optic nerve, uh, superior and inferior rectus, and then there's a oblique set, which is the superior and inferior oblique that can turn the eye with light ability. Uh, and we said before that these have very, very small muscle units, which means that each motor neuron supplies only a few cells, so they're capable of extremely fine, precise control of the eye. So now we can move on to more physiology or somewhat physics of eye uh, function. And the first, we'll start out talking about light a little bit. Uh, the rays of waves of light are bent by going from one media to another, which is critical to the physiology of the eye. So light, we call it refraction, or the waves are bent by going from, let's say, air and in, in, through glass or from an air-water uh, interface. But whenever they change, go through a media, they're bent by that media. Here's a very simple explanation or uh, example of refraction of light. If you're looking into a pond of water and see a fish, the light from the fish, the reflected light from the fish is actually bent as it comes to the surface and then out to you. And so the fish appears closer to you than, than or appears uh, to be 
is closer to you than his actual position. Here's his actual position, and he appears to be here. So anyway, if you were to try and shoot this with an arrow or something, you'd miss him by a little bit. So anyway, the rays of light are waves, rays are bent as they go from one media to another. And we take use of this when we uh, develop lenses. And you've all had physics classes and know that convex lenses uh, cause light to go from straight to converging waveform. And a convex lens causes the opposite, causes convergence of, of uh, light waves. And so the lenses in our eyes are convex. Uh, we have two uh, lens systems, really, in essence, one that's adjustable, the lens of the eye, but the cornea actually does a lot of the refracting of light waves. People say it refracts 75% of the, the refraction that occurs, occurs in the cornea. But the difference, of course, is the lens is responsible for focusing the light on the uh, area of greatest acuity of vision. Uh, because the light waves are crossed as they go through the eyeball, we actually, the image that appears on the retina is upside down reversed from the image that we see. But we grew up seeing that, so it doesn't seem like that to us, I guess. The accommodation or focusing of light on the retina uh, depends on that ciliary body and suspensory ligament system we talked about before. Uh, so when we want to view objects that are very close to the uh, eye, we contract the ciliary muscles and that relaxes the, the uh, suspensory ligaments and then the uh, lens actually rounds up and becomes more con con uh, convective, I guess one could say, and it allows the more convergence of the light rays. So since they're divergent, you round it up and then they uh, converge closer to the fovea than they would otherwise. This uh, rounding of the lens is the elastic nature of the, the, the uh, lens itself. There's a lot of elastic fibers in it. And so it automatically wants to form a ball type arrangement and what the suspensory ligaments do is they pull it outward into a more flatter view. So when we're reading or doing something very uh, close, then we contract the muscle, the cir uh, circular muscle, that takes the stress off of these suspensory ligaments and then the eyeball rounds. Now that's why you tire when you read. You're trying to contract this muscle that actually the elasticity of the lens is what's causing the roundness, the convex nature of the lens. If you're looking at something that's far away, where the lenses are coming to you not in a divergent manner, but in a parallel manner, in this case, uh, you want to relax the ciliary muscles. So now that relaxing stretches the ligaments and then pulls the lens outward or flatter and so then you have the ability to look at something farther away, which actually requires less effort from the eye, if you will, from the ciliary muscle. All of us have a minimum focus distance. If you were to take a, uh, some object, we often use the look at the, the point of a pencil and have the patient tell us when, when the tip of the pencil is no more in focus, that's your, your near point. And that near point moves further and further away with uh, age. What happens is your lens isn't as elastic as it used to be. Um, as I've said already a couple times in the class, and will many others, we use elastic, we lose elastic filaments throughout our life. They gradually lose their uh, characteristic, they become less and less stretchable, and the lens is no exception. So gradually this lens that used to form when you're young, a very tight ball, doesn't pull in as much as we can. So our near point moves further and further away. And you can graph it in the population, and as you go from 20 to 30 to here you guys are in the beautiful prime, you move out here, I'm off the graph. 
But as you move further and further, you're, you're holding the paper. You see your parents are holding the paper further and further away until they're setting it on the floor and trying to read it and having the kids hold the paper across the room. And then you go to Walgreens and buy some reading glasses and so forth. So this is because that lens doesn't round up as much as it used to be, and it's a fact of life. All of us uh, gradually are on this horrible downslope as we age. This, yeah, and I threw that little last line in there, and the students are always missing this point on the test, so put a little star there and make sure you don't overlook it. It doesn't pertain to the graph. Letter B is just saying that part of the accommodation that occurs when you're looking at near or far objects, that doesn't really have anything to do with the near point, but part of accommodation is to constrict the pupil when we're looking at something really, really close. It just that removes all the stuff around. If you're reading a book and a text, you don't want to have your pupil open and be able to see everything around. So part of accommodation to viewing close objects is constriction of the pupil um, to reduce the visual field. I added this if it's not in your thing. I threw this in this morning because I thought it should be there. I used to have it. I don't know how it slipped out. But this is right out of Born and Volpefe. It's a nice uh, overview of what happens with nearsightedness and farsightedness as astigmatism, just the, the most uh, oft uh, visual problems. Uh, myopia is when the eye is essentially uh, longer than it should be. And so uh, the objects focus in front of the eye, and so they're not uh, clear, they're not focused as fine as they can, and uh, uh, glasses or some other uh, contacts or surgery can correct that problem. Hyperopia is, is farsightedness. In this case, it's like the eye is too short, and so the object is focused behind where it should be on the fovea, and again, one would need some other correction to to fix that. And finally, astigmatism is when the curvature of the cornea isn't even, so you're unevenly uh, converging those, those light rays, and, and it will place the object slightly out of, again, clear focus, and, and there's, there's all kinds of interesting ways to, to look for that. We have a, a lab on sensory uh, in a couple of weeks, and we'll go through some of these tests to see how you're doing on farsightedness and so forth. Okay, physiology of vision. Um, one of the most complicated stories about uh, the eye is the structure of the retina, and it's layers, as I said before, of neurons. So it's a layered structure, and the first part that's hard to visualize is we're looking at, look at the large or the small inset of the eye, we're taking a section of the retina right here. So down here is the sclera and then the choroid coat, and the, the deepest part of the retina is the photoreceptor. So the, the photoreceptor layer is right against the choroid coat, and then you go out further, they call it the pigment layer, the choroid and then the pigment layer. You go out further, and there's a set of bipolar neurons, and then further, finally, are the uh, optic nerve cells, they call them the, the ganglion cells. So you go from photoreceptors, the signal is conducted to bi through bipolar neurons, and then into the optic nerve that goes up to the visual cortex we'll talk about when we get to the brain. Now, you'll notice two other families of cells here, the amacrine cells and the horizontal cells that are laterally uh, connected, and we'll talk about those uh, two populations of cells and what they do in just a minute. So the straight through, if you will, or parallel architecture is photoreceptors, the bipolar to the optic nerve, but there's these two populations of the horizontal cells that co connects the, the other, the direct pathway. And again, the arrow here indicates that light that gets to the photoreceptor has to go past the optic nerve and past the bipolar center to cell neurons to reach the photoreceptor. So it actually goes through several layers of this retina before it gets to the photoreceptors. Uh, what happens is we process this for years, and so we've taken the 
all these things out of the visual field. You can actually, through some trickery, see blood vessels in front of your retina if you have light come from another source. We'll show you that in the lab. But part of our central processing of the image is to remove all the shadows and things that would otherwise occur and just end up with filtered signal that comes from the photoreceptors. As you all know, there are two families of photoreceptors. One we call uh, is responsible for scotopic vision, and, and cones are responsible for photopic vision. These are the color receptors, and these, again, are the black and white receptors that we'll talk about. The, the rods also are responsible for dim light. They work best when we have very little light available, so night or, or uh, clothes where there's no light available. And the cones are responsible for color vision. All our perception of color is dependent on cone activity. The rods are predominantly found outside the, the fovea, out in the outside of our visual field, where the uh, cones are very precisely concentrated in the fovea. So this is a representation of the photoreceptors in the retina. And you see on each side is this large population of rods with very large population of cones just centered right in the fovea area. You'll notice the absence of all photoreceptors, again, depicted where the optic nerve is. That's what that little thing is. So uh, slightly, usually 20 degrees or so off from our primary focus site. The parafobial cells have high uh, convergence. So the, the cells that are way off on the side have a lot of bipolar cells converging on one ganglion cell. So that means that they're extremely sensitive to light to, and can function even in the dimmest light. The cells right in the fovea directly connect to the ganglion cells, and that means they're most able to have acute or precise vision. So uh, if you don't have any convergence and a given photoreceptor goes right to the brain, that means you can very accurately tell uh, very fine structures where out on the periphery you can't, but you can uh, see dim light better. That's why if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're trying to find your way around the room and you know the light uh, switches somewhere over here, if you look just to the left or right of where you think it is, you'll see it a lot better than if you look right at it. You have to use the uh, convergence of those parafolial receptors to be able to see in dim light. So less acuity in a large receptive field. Uh, the reason for the lateral cells, the cells that go laterally, both the amacrine and the horizontal cells, is they allow processing of the retinal image. Uh, I like the term better, increased contrast. When we developed the satellite cameras, one of the things that they did was they digitized images from the satellite camera just in the computer. And what the computer does is enhance the bright and inhibit the dark or increase contrast between what's bright and uh, what's dark in a digital image. And if you do that, you can see things that you couldn't even see uh, without this, uh, we call it image processing. So a lot of our modern microscopes and all the satellite cameras and so forth do digital processing of images. Well, that's what our eye has done for years. It increases the, the brightness of objects we see to our brain and decreases the, uh, the objects around that or the brightness of objects around that. And that's what these uh, horizontal cells do. So if some cell has a bright light going to it, it'll inhibit the cells on each side, so that increases contrast. This is a image that tries to show you how lateral processing is using, being used in your own brain. And so because this uh, square is so bright, it has made the image in the center look dark gray. But if you look way over here, this center is actually the same density as this one. And it's not, see this is inhibiting the cells that are sending out information for this where this is not. So that lateral inhibition is adjusting the light or brightness of 
things on each side of a very bright cell, images, if you will, if that makes sense. This is another, I don't have this in your thing, but it's another, if you stare at this, it drives you crazy for a while, but if you stare at one dot, you'll see some of the dots around it all of a sudden going black. So this is, again, another way to see um, uh, lateral inhibition going on. I'll take it off and drive you crazy real fast. The, the wavelength of light, which we call a visual light, is a very small part of the whole spectrum of radiation or electromagnetic spectrum. It's right here between ultraviolet and infrared, and it's a very narrow wave of the spectrum from what we call wavelengths of 400 to 750 nanometers. And so this is supposed to represent, the, and you see the shorter wavelengths are the purples and the longer wavelengths are the reds. So the different colors are different wavelengths within that visual spectrum. So these light waves alter, it turns out, the form of chemicals within the, the photoreceptors. And I'll just kind of introduce, I think I can get through most of this story. Uh, the the Receptors are on the shelves, if you will, or the membranes, inner membranes within the rods and the cones. So both rods and cones have these stacked discs, we call them, and part of those those discs have integral proteins uh, that essentially are going to convert the the light wavelength into a light, into a action potential that we can understand. So this is a uh, integral protein uh, that's within, called retinal, it's within the membrane of these discs inside both the cones and the rods. And within it, you can see it's shown there on red there, there's a chromatophore, which essentially means a chemical sensitive to light, that has two parts, retinal and auxin, and light changes or uh, causes a transformation in this chemical causing it to go from uh, cis to trans. And this small uh, change in, tr in conformation causes a signal that can uh, alter uh, interaction between proteins in the membrane. Uh, the, the photons of light degrade the photopigment. And part of the story is you, you have to recover the photopigment. So every time, it's, we call it bleaching, every time we expose your retina to light, it goes to this transformation and it doesn't instantly go back. It has to gradually go back. So there's a period where we're refractory to, to more stimulation if you really get in a bright light, as you know. We'll talk about that in a while. So it's changed from cis to trans, as I already said, and then it dissociates from opsin. And let me show you the G protein cascade with this all. Uh, it was in uh, the retina that we first discovered G-proteins that I've already mentioned several times in the class. But the G-protein that we use as a signaling starter of the whole cascade is called transducin. And so the visual pigment is within this rhodopsin, which is the G-protein receptor. Uh, most G-proteins have a ligand that binds the receptor that initiates the dissociation of the G-protein. In this case, it's light. So light activates the, the G-protein receptor, which we call rhodopsin, and that changes the affinity of the transducin, the alpha, beta, and gamma part, which is the G-protein, such that the alpha component comes off the beta and gamma. This is classic of G-proteins. So this is a G protein, this is the, in blue, the G protein receptor. So the alpha dissociates from the beta and gamma, and dissociated it couples with GTP, and GTP uh, activates phosphodiesterase. And we haven't talked about phosphodiesterase, but it's a, maybe we have, but it's an enzyme that uh, uh, inactivates cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, and its target in the eye is cyclic GMP. So in most signaling processes, phosphodiesterase stops the signal. But here, very interestingly, things are backwards. And the phosphodiesterase is activated by the activated G protein that denatures cyclic GMP to cyclic G 
to, to GMP, not cyclic anymore. And, and that, oops, uh, and that closes this channel. So the channel is held open, it's a sodium channel, by cyclic GMP. In the inactivation of cyclic GMP, now uh, all of a sudden sodium is not conductive. And remember, like all cells, sodium goes in and depolarizes the cell. So if you close that channel, you're going to hyperpolarize the cell. And uh, not only sodium, but also calcium and it's one of those nonspecific channels that causes depolarization and, uh, and signaling and action potential. But in the presence of light, we're going to hyperpolarize it. And that's shown in the next couple of slides. So this is uh, dark, and this represents what goes on in light. So in dark, those channels are open. So that means sodium and calcium and so forth can go through, and that will send up uh, an action potential, essentially neurotransmitter release through the, uh, through the we call it the inner segment of, the, of that whole photoreceptor. We call this part that's the uh, sensitive to light the outer segment, most people, then the inner segment releases the neurotransmitter. So in the absence of light, we have neurotransmitter releases. It's exactly back backwards than you think. Once it becomes bright, those channels slam closed because cyclic GMP is inactivated, and now it hyperpolarizes, and the, the uh, membrane becomes very polarized and doesn't release any neurotransmitter. So light causes a decrease in neurotransmitter releases, exactly backwards of most signaling processes. So here is a recording, supposedly, from nerves that come out of those photoreceptors could be optic nerves, and you, when exposed to bright light, they hyperpolarize. They go from minus 40 to minus 65, and you get less and less neurotransmitter out of them. So we know when we see bright objects by the absence of action potentials, just backwards than you think. This is that story about the bleaching of the photopigments. So once those photopigments are exposed to light, they have to go back to that transform. It doesn't happen instantly. In fact, it, the rate of adaptation decreases with age. But uh, the receptors, just like every other receptor, is refractory. But it's quite a long time in most cases uh, compared to other phenomena. So when you go from very bright light to a dark area, you'll find it takes a while to acclimatize and see anything again. Um, I always remember when I tell this story about my children taking my children into an uh, afternoon movie, go to the matinee at the local theater, and my children run into the theater and find a seat, and the old man's back trying to adapt. He can't find where they are, and they're giggling. I can find them because they're all giggling at me, running into everything as I'm trying to find my way into the room. So as we age, the rate at which we accommodate to for bright light decreases tremendously. Uh, the reason we can see objects in different colors is because the cones have slightly different retinal that responds to different wavelengths. So it turns out we have pigments that respond to red, green, and blue wavelengths, and we determine the color based by how many of each of those families of cones is activated. So it's essentially a it's like the old TVs that had uh, projectors for each light. We have receptors for each different wavelength. And finally, just a comment about stereoscopic vision. And I think we'll uh, leave it at that and go to the, the clicker question. Um, we uh, perceive how far things are from us by the fact that we have two different receptors, two different eyes and the objects appear slightly different locations on the two retinas depending on how close they are to us. So when objects are very close, they're spread out more on the two retinas, and we learn to judge distance by that separation. Uh, where they're far away, then they're closer to the media, middle the, to the middle part of the retina. And so it's by that uh, separation that we learn to understand how far things are. And what that means is two things. One, you have to have equal vision in both eyes to perceive depth perception very well. 
and you have to have two photoreceptors. So if you lose one eye, you don't have very much ability to figure out how far things are. And also a good number of us has different acuities in the two eyes. So uh, there's a lot of difference in depth perception. We also have tests for that in our lab. And you'll find out some of your classmates, you don't want to leave the parking lot at the same time <laughs> as them. Okay, I think that's a nice time to break. So let me move on. Oh, there's only one more slide. I'll do that. Um, tools. That's not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to see that. So let me go on and do the clickers. Oops, where's the little clicker thingy? You're going to all know that question. Okay, I don't know where the clicker thingy went, but I'll have to bring it up. I started it once. Oh, is it over there? There it is. There it is now. Okay. Okay, here we go. Should work now. Yeah? Okay, first question. Cerebral spinal fluid has the constituency of plasma excess, synovial fluid, intracellular fluid. Seconds left. Ten. Okay, I think the majority is right. And it's different than all of them. It's a very unique fluid. It's definitely not interstitial or inter or extracellular. It's uh, quite unique and formed from the arachnoid, or the, um, not the arachnoid, Billy, from uh, special cells that produce it. So very unique fluid. One of the uniquenesses is it does not have any uh, amino acids, as we've said before. Okay, question two. You expect the greatest convergence in the neural pathway from sensory neurons supplying which of these? So where would you have the greatest convergence? Whoops, that's not what I wanted. I wanted that. Okay. I think that question was on last year's test. Let's see how you guys did. Uh, Ninety-three percent. That's right. The thigh has the greatest convergence, so you wouldn't want any convergence in the fingertips or the lips. So the greatest would be the areas where you have a the largest uh, area of receptors. Okay, number three. What, uh, which structure reabsorbs the cerebral spinal fluid? I said it was continually circulated. Where is it reabsorbed? Everybody knew this. 
So, of course, ependymal cells make up the choroid plexus that secretes the cerebrospinal fluid. Microglia attack foreign objects, so the arachnoid villi is the little neuro venous sinuses. Whoops. Uh, the venous sinuses that... Do not, yeah, y'all got it right. Anyway, I think it was 90% 90, 90 was correct for the uh, arachnoid villi. Number four. Which of the following cutaneous receptors are adapted to uh, transduce vibration? I mentioned that last time. Okay, I think 45 seconds is too long. 10 seconds. Two, one. Okay, and almost 100%. You got it correct. It's Pacinian corpuscles. Remember the little onions that can change shape back and forth? So I showed you a little diagram of that. And number five, which is not characteristic of receptor potentials? Ten seconds. Okay, um, you put C. Uh, they definitely are conducted decrementally. They are the same as a local potential. The amplitude is a proportional stimulus intensity. But they don't all depolarize, they're all hyperpolarized. Eyes do hyperpolarize, they're polarized, we just saw. But many receptors depolarize, so they do different things. So anyway, A, B, and C, D are correct. And uh, What's the it's uh, C. C. Okay.